All Hail the Carrion King by Thomas Godfrey Chapter 1 The Last True Jester of the West All Hail the Carrion King the words escaped the lips of the pallid jester that lay on the shore of the Montecana River. His eyes were closed, his skin bloated and clammy, as if he had drowned. He was drenched, water dripping from his every orifice. The words of praise that had been so spoken gurgled and suffocated. He was garbed in a festive garment of royal reds and deep blacks, striped in blazing contrast with pluming sleeves and pointed boots. Atop his pale head sat a jester's cap, similarly colored but noticeably missing one of what should have been a queen quintet of bells. Suddenly, the jester lurched upward and vomited. He sputtered and gagged as an elixir of river water, bile, and half-digested food leapt from between his teeth and pooled on the sand before him. The vomit was tinted red, but it was not comprised of blood. Rather, it was chunks of rare meat and cheap wine. The jester groaned and let his eyes flutter open. A collection of fishermen that had been watching the clown, who they had assumed to be dead, took a step back in fear as they caught sight of the jester's eerie eyes. They were quite unlike the eyes of a normal man. Their whites were too pure, the pupils too abyssal, and the iris was a color none of the assembled fishermen could quite identify. It flashed in vibrant hues, ever-changing, but no color that they had ever seen joined the swirling vortex. The jester turned his unnatural eyes upon them and looked up and down. In total, there were four. Each was between the ages of 20 and 45, with thick hair and thicker beards. Their limbs were coated in thick muscles, and their clothing was well-worn leathers, their boots made of what the jester assumed to be seal skin. He blinked more water out of his eyes and began to massage his body. He grumbled to himself when he felt its bloat and took note of its cold green coloring. As if by magic, the drowned jester returned to life. The water left his system, the color returned to his even now pale skin, and his clothes fell loosely against his skinny frame. Then the jester attempted to draw in a breath, but found that a sharp pain racked his body. He let out a high-pitched grunt and groped behind him, searching for whatever the external cause of the injury was. His pale fingers closed around the hilt of a knife, and he wrenched it free, no blood being spilled from the wound. He sighed and rolled his shoulders, the punctured skin of his back rippling and coming to heal of its own accord. He tossed the knife into the air and caught it effortlessly, holding it up to his eye's height for a moment. The blade was exquisitely crafted, the twilight bouncing off of its polished surface, its tilt embossed with a near litany of ancient text. The jester shrugged and lifted up the hem of his top, revealing a duo of knives tucked into his trousers. The newly acquired knife joined them. He turned back to the fisherman. Did I say anything? He asked in the most hypnotically lyrical voice, smoothing out his jester's garb and slowly inching to his feet. The men gazed at him, aghast, one of them even reaching for a holy trinket. The jester laughed. <laughs> I'm not dead. He purred. Not yet, at any rate. The fishermen exchanged another bout of wary glances. All hail the Carrion King. The youngest among them said meekly. The jester's unnatural eyes locked on the man, causing him to jump backward in fright. What? The jester asked curtly. That's, that's what you said, the man squeaked. The jester frowned, stroking his vomit-coated chin in contemplation. All hail the Carrion King, he mused. How did I get here? You just washed up, a grizzled older fisherman said. A wave came in and you came in with it. We thought that you were dead. The jester smiled, a warm gesture of good humor. Your concern is appreciated, he said sweetly. He frowned again, his mind nagging him. Where is here? He asked, looking up at the quartet of still stupefied fishermen. The four of them exchanged glances. Well, the river is the Montecana River, but the closest town is Brookshire. The jester cut in dreamily. Yes, he mused. I know. He took a few steps forward, a maiden's skip to said steps. He turned his eerie eyes to the darkening sky and cocked his head to one side, as if listening to a tiny voice that only he could hear. The jester snapped his attention back to the group and smiled, a million ill truths coming to the forefront of his mind in a matter of moments. His eyes flashed a maddening array of unnamed colors, and he began to speak in each tune. The first... First, his attention focused on the youngest. He was slighter than the rest, but given time would achieve the functional bulk they all carried. His beard was thinner, his hair fuller, and in that moment the jester knew that he was a virgin. Untouched, unadulterated, uncorrupt, and that made scrying his fate all the more easy. You did not try to save him, despite 
what you tell yourself at night, he said dreamily. The young man's eyes widened in panic. The jester turned to the second man, clearly the first man's elder brother. Yes, she is sleeping with the blacksmith, and you know that she is, he said as the man's face contorted with rage. He turned to the third. She never forgave you, despite what she said, he said gravely. Then he turned his attention to the last, the oldest among them whose mighty beard was streaked with grey, the hair of his head beginning to fall away. Your daughter didn't get lost at sea. She ran away from you and your fists. As quick as the trance had come, it was gone, and the jester clutched his head. Sorry, he muttered, his voice sounding sober for the first time. There's something in the field, gentlemen, and it knows what we've done, he smiled. Just who do you think you are? The oldest man snarled. The jester looked genuinely perplexed for a moment. I'm Nguyen, he finally said. I have no name. I was not granted one. I do, however, have a title. They call me the last true jester of the West. We were in the East, the youngest man pointed out skulkily, the jester's words echoing painfully inside of his ears. The jester smiled and shrugged. I was in the West he said, and besides, everywhere in the West is somewhere if you think about it. The man looked puzzled. Oh, sorry, the jester exclaimed. The plane, it is not a plane, it's more like a ball. He made a faint spinning motion with his hands. Anyway, I must be going. He stumbled forward, dodging his own heap of reddish vomit. Sorry to break our chat, but I need a bit of food, and then I need to be on my way. The carts of the Carrion King awaits. The men exchanged horrified glances. You can't say that. The oldest man hissed. The jester looked at him, puzzled. I just did, he said simply. If one of the angels hears you, you're done. They'll whip you. Cut out your tongue. There is no court of the Carrion King. The jester looked at the man sadly. My muscle-bound friend, we both know that's not true, and they won't hurt me. Arrogant bastard will get us all flogged, one of the men muttered. The jester smirked. It's far from arrogance. No, the angels cannot hurt me. He pranced a few steps forward. I trust there's a good tavern. He muttered, I'm famished. The four fishermen exchanged glances as the jester pranced away, the bells on the tip of his hat jangling merrily. As he walked up the sandy banks and into the grassy hills, he frowned, the telltale jangling of his jolly bells sounding slightly off. He reached up and plucked the hat from its perch, spilling a small fountain of river water onto his hairless head. Bizarrely enough, the jester's head was perfectly shaped, perfectly pale, and perfectly hairless. It did not look shaven or bald, but as if hair had never grown there to begin with. He muttered something underneath his breath as he gazed at where the missing bell used to be and caressed the fraying fabric that was left in its place. Pouting slightly, he placed the hat back upon the scalp and continued toward the loose collection of buildings that loomed on the twilight-bathed horizon. The town of Brookshire was quaint, mostly consisting of farming homesteads. The buildings were mostly made out of wood, but a few of the larger and older structures were comprised of heavy stone. The majority of the buildings were spread out far onto the horizon, mammoth barns and homesteads surrounded by lush fields of corn. The densest collections of buildings were directly ahead. Arranged vaguely into the high streets, the buildings were made of stone, and the majority were sizable. The largest headed the high street and was a multi-story structure, a clock tower embedded into a spire, the rest of the buildings running out from it. The jester entered the high street, sweeping his horrid eyes over the collection. The the first one made him stop. It was a single-story structure, and stained-glass windows dominated its sides. It had clearly once been a religious building. The jester could faintly see where the original religious symbolism had been mounted. The faint after-images of untouched stonework displaying the symbols of the long-suppressed faith. However, the stained-glass windows preached a different creed entirely. Displayed in each of the windows was a horrid creature. Seated on a throne of desecrated bones with rings made of the vertebrae and a bloody patchwork of flayed skin skin draped over its body like a cloak, was a fat king. The crown of severed tongues was perched atop his head. Its skin was motley and pale, its teeth yellow, its eyes red. Platters of bloody meat were laid out around the bloated monarch, gore dribbling between its fingers and down its bulbous chin. The Carrion King. 
The gesture regarded his adversary for a moment, lifted his hat in respect, then continued on his way. He headed down the street, scouring the array of stonework for a tavern, his ears pricked at the sound of drunken revelry and a bard's music. The jester grinned and picked up his pace, skipping like a schoolgirl down the lane, the bells atop his head jangling once more. Then he froze when he caught sight of a sickly figure perched atop the clock tower. Tattered robes of a once fine linen enwrapped its gaunt frame. A set of fleshy wings coated its greasy gray feathers plumed behind it, and a thin tangle of stringy hair hung around its pallid features. Its face was skull-like, with slits in lieu of a nose, and most ghastly of all, devoid of eyes. Where eyes once had sat in the creature's skull, now a rotting clump of severed nerves and tendons dangled from the sockets, but despite its slightlessness, its scrutiny seemed to cut through the town. The jester waved to the tattered angel, then turned on his heels and pranced into the tavern. The interior was warm and bustling. Kitchens were visible through a small doorway at the back of the varnished room. Smoke and steam were rolling into the main tavern. A gruff and elderly bartender was a smold a gruff and elderly bartender with a smoldering cigar clutched between his teeth, only adding to it. The patrons sat around in clumps, talking, laughing, and drinking merrily, scantily clad waitresses drifting through the chaos to elegantly deposit plates of steaming food before the various guests. Dominating the leftmost side of the room was a hastily constructed stage. Presently, a lone bard sat upon it, strumming an instrument and singing a nonsense song in a beautifully powerful voice, a nonsense song that large swaths of the cavern were eager to join in with. As he loomed in the doorway, stray river water still dripping from his garments, the jester could not help but smile at the sight. Dozens of people were engaged in the merriment, drunkenly slamming pints of ale into the tables in rhythm with the song and blurting out the words without a care in their musicality. It faintly reminded the last true jester that there was some good left in the world, even if he had to wash up on the eastern shores to find it. With a spring in his step, he entered the tavern and meandered through the crowd toward the bar, the sing-along rising around him to assail his senses. As he walked, he found his fingers clicking to the plodding melody of their own accord, and let the roguish grin come to dominate his face. The jester managed to find an empty stool by the bar and leapt forward, effortlessly perching himself atop it. He swiveled to face the bartender and beckoned him over. The aging man rolled his eyes and lumbered toward the jester, pulling the cigar from his mouth as he did so. What do you want? He asked in a voice that was tainted by cancerous gargles. A pint of your cheapest ale and something fried, the jester replied, eerily audible over the din. The bartender nodded gruffly and redeposited the cigar in between his puffy lips. He turned on his heel and poured a pint of watery ale into a dirty glass, then handed it back to the jester, sweeping his tiny eyes over him inquisitively. The jester licked his lips and clasped the lukewarm mug, raising the noxious fluid up to his mouth and taking a massive gulp trying as he might not to gag. The bartender looked as though he was going to ask the jester a number of questions, but before he could, the bard's performance picked up into a crescendo, then abruptly cut off. He and the rest of the tavern slamming their feet into the floor and yelling, hey, at the top of their voices. The jester grinned again and turned to face the room, which was now erupting into good-natured laughter and a host of applause. The bard, who was a young man with a haircut akin to a rat's nest, rose to his feet and took a bow the applause growing even louder, the jester found himself joining in, slamming his unnaturally smooth hands together and adding their voices to the chorus. Thank you, the bard exclaimed, grinning proudly. You've been amazing this evening. The tavern continued to clap, the aging bartender shaking his head as he tried to communicate with the kitchen staff. The jester took another mighty swig of the stomach-curdling brew and flickered his unholy gaze to the windows. It was getting dark out. The applause finally died away and the bard was joined on the stage by an older man wearing a long purple coat. Let's hear it again for Miles! The purple-coated man bellowed heartily. The tavern erupted back into cheers, and Miles took another bow. Once the second bout of applause had died away, the purple-coated man spoke again. Now, it's time for some clowns. 
he proclaimed. The tavern cheered once more. Here's the local talent, let's hear it for Melissa Talloway. The jester turned in the clapping and watched a young woman dressed in a similar outfit to him nervously mount the stage. Thick tussles of blonde hair cascaded from underneath her ill-fitted jester's cap, and a collection of particularly drunk men close to the stage began to hoot and clap, offsetting the young jester even more so. Miles the Bard retreated from the stage alongside the purple-coated man, leaving Melissa on her own. A few wolf howls drifted up from the crowd, and the young jester shifted uncomfortably before she began to speak. The aging bartender slapped the steaming clump of fried fish before the jester. The jester wrinkled his nose at it, then picked it up with his bare hands and shoveled it into his mouth. The bartender shook his head disapprovingly once again, then lumbered away from the enigmatic jester. The jester continued to chew through the fish, grease coming to coat the interior of his mouth. Then Melissa began her jester routine. The jester let the remains of the fish flop back onto his plate and eyed up the young woman. He could see how nervous she was, but as she moved about the stage, she seemed to loosen up. The jester sat up straight and watched intently, curious about what passed for comedy in the small town of Brookshire. The jester was swiftly disappointed. Melissa began to speak, but it was not her words that came out of her mouth. They were the words of the Carrion King. The jester shook his head and noticed many in the crowd were rolling their eyes, clearly not even as far out as Brookshire. The word of the Carrion King was prolific and extremely dull. Melissa launched into a deluge of jokes and comments that the people had been subjected to time after time. She talked about the stupidity of the followers of the last great king, the insanity of those who claimed that there was a Carrion court, and made joke after tired joke about the glory of the Carrion King. The jester quickly lost interest, Melissa's attempts at comedy drifting through his ears without being perceived by the brain. The jester returned his attention to the greasy remains of his fish and began to pick at it. He fondled the battered chunks of cheap meat and slowly gnawed his way through them. The tolerant jokes of the Carrion King swirling around him like a linguistic vortex of malcontent. However, the sudden outburst from the crowd snapped the jester's attention back to reality. Fuck the Carrion King! An old man hollered from the back of the room. The jester, along with many of the other patrons, reeled at the sound. An aging man with the long white beard that often caricatured wisdom raised an almost empty mug of mead and defiance. Melissa trailed off, confusion and moderate distress becoming upper features. Fuck the Carrion King! <clears throat> The man slurred again. And fuck his court. Melissa gasped, covering her mouth with her hands. The collection of elderly gentlemen sitting around the heckler let out a jeering hoot, most of them slamming their beverages into the table. Fuck the Carrion King, another shouted. There is a court of the Carrion King, a third drunkenly shrieked. Melissa went white, and the purple-coated man rushed back onto the stage, took one of Melissa's hands in his, and raised it into the air. Let's hear it for Melissa, he yelled, his voice clearly infused with false enthusiasm, his eyes darting to the door of the tavern as if he expected an angel to burst it down at any moment. The room stayed silent, most patrons still in shock from the old men at the back that who were jostling and joking amongst each other and coming up with a near-endless list of explicitives with which to describe the Carrion King. The jester grinned at this, cocking his head to one side, his quartet of bells jangling merrily as he did so. He returned his attention to the stage and and saw that Melissa looked on the verge of tears. The purple-coated man still hoisted her arm triumphantly, awaiting applause that did not appear to be coming. So naturally, the jester began to clap. All eyes reeled to his face. Many of the patrons taking in the jester for the first time, almost all of them instantly offset by the unnameable color of his eyes. The jester continued to clap, a true round of applause devoid of any irony or satire. Logically, he had been logically he had once been a young jester not that he could remember it and would have surely had some performances that had not been received warmly although he had never stooped to melissa's blatant pandering either melissa looked at him gratefully for a moment then averted her eyes an agonized expression forming on her face that informed the jester that she would rather like to never have existed so as to spare her at the embarrassment of this moment the jester rose to his feet and continued to clap sweeping his unholy eyes over 
over the tavern. Even the cooks had poked their heads out of the kitchen to see what was amiss. Then, slowly but surely, the rest of the crowd began to applaud alongside him. Even the posse of old men at the back, the purple-coated man positively beamed, shaking Melissa's hand triumphantly. Once again. The jester returned to his stool. The purple-coated man released Melissa, and the girl made a break for the edge of the stage, pulling off the jester's hat as she did so and fighting back tears. As she made her way through the crowd toward the exit, she caught the jester's gaze for a moment. He gave her a small salute, and she nodded to him gratefully. Then she hastily burst open the front door and ran into the night. Well, how was that for some crowd interaction? The purple-coated man said nervously. The group of old men at the back collectively raised their drinks and let out a good-natured hoot. Many of the other patrons laughed at this, a wide grin befalling the face of the jester. Well, next up is our very own Isaac Veritas, the purple-coated man announced, gesturing for the second jester to mount the stage. The jester swept his bizarre eyes over the young man who answered the call. Isaac Veritas looked a little older than Melissa, but not by much. He had a head of dark curls that poked out from underneath the jester's cap of his own. His eyes were blazing blue, and he had soft features and an immaculate, clean-shaven face. He ran onto the stage and launched himself onto a backflip, twirling heels overhead, landing back on his pointy-toed feet. The crowd let out a cheer of this, and Isaac grinned. It was roguish, a boyish grin that made the jester realize just how young this man really was. Not just in numerical age, but in the measurement of innocence. The jester's eyes suddenly swirled, but he knew that this boy was an idealist. A man who wanted to use the stage to twist the lies and reveal the truth. He was gazing at a hero who had thus far been depraved of a story. He began to watch intently. Isaac pushed a few stray tussles of hair onto his eyes and gazed out at the crowd. That entire thing reminded me of this man I saw on a high street the other day, he began confidently. He was one of those guys that you looked at and thought, how on earth are you not the gray's waste? There was a few half-hearted chuckles at this. I mean, I mean, he was about as gray and festered as the meat that old Ferris puts in his special pies. The boy gestured to the old gruff bartender, and a few people let out genuine laughs. The jester smiled. Tattered robes, which looked nice and pricey, probably from somewhere out west, and one of those weird banners that you used to see on the militia groups holding. The ones with those catchy little mantras on them. You know, the, like, thralls are people and demons rights now. The jester continued to watch, eagerly awaiting the punchline, providing one would emerge. Anyway... Isaac continued, so this guy's sign said the Carrion King is real, and I was like, well, no shit. There are a few more chuckles. Of course he's real. I mean, who's claiming that he isn't? We've all seen him, right? He's on our church and everything. Isaac began to pace around the stage as he got more engrossed with his act. So, now what? The people in the West are claiming the Carrion King doesn't exist? I hope that we got a memo before our angels start to believe the same thing. I mean, that must be quite the crisis of purpose, mustn't it? One day you're an angel just meandering around, not a care in the world, enforcing the laws of the Carrion King, and the next minute your boss doesn't even exist? Who knows? Maybe by the time our angels catch up with the Western ones, they won't exist anymore. Imagine that. You're an angel of the Carrion King, and you get a message from the West that says, sorry, but uh, we just realize that you too do not exist. What happens then? Do they just accept it like, oh, silly me, and just disappear in a puff of smoke? By now, almost the whole room was laughing, the jester's grin broadening. Isaac drunk in the laughter, splaying his arms wide. But, I mean, we all know what doesn't exist, right? He looked at the crowd knowingly. The court of the Carrion King. He winked, causing shrieks of laughter to erupt from the old men in the back. There is no court of the Kyrian king, the ringleader slurred, letting out a hearty laugh. Isaac pretended to shield his gaze from the sun and began to look for the source of the noise in a pantomime of a lookout. That there is an honest citizen, he said, stifling a giggle. The crowd laughed at this, and the jester found his own lips parting to reveal his pearly, slightly too pointed teeth. Anyway, so whilst there is no court of the Kyrian king, what would happen if, say, the Kyrian king who we all know exists. He paused for a moment, a grin blossoming on his face. Oh, come on, he jokingly exclaimed. There was more laughter. What happens if he was to say, I don't know, purchase a courthouse? Isaac paused to let the joke sink in. As the seconds drew on, the penny dropped for the tavern's patrons, and almost the entirety of the tavern burst out laughing. That would give the angels quite a headache. The door burst open. The jester, along 
with the rest of the tavern, swiveled their heads to face the disturbance. Isaac froze, the end of his joke caught in his throat. The men at the back let out a comically over-the-top reaction, one of them literally leaping from their seat and spilling his remaining mead all over the place. Then the tavern fell silent. Framed in the doorway was an angel. Its skin hung on its bones like drapes, its greasy wings drawn close to its body, its slit-like nostrils flared. The severed tendons still attached to the sockets of its once eyes twitching slightly as it took in the scene. Flanking the angel was a duo of the Carrion Kings of Blind Knights, garbed in dark armor that completely concealed whatever humanity they may or may not have had. Slowly, the angel stalked forward, a scroll clasped in one of its sickly, taloned hands. Its nostrils continued to flare, and as it passed by the tables, the patrons visibly stiffened, avoiding all eye contact with the creature. Slowly but surely, it made its way toward the back of the room, to where the posse of old men sat. No good-natured fun was found in their eyes now, and they seemed to sober immediately. The angel unfurled its wings and came to stop, the duo of knights looming behind it. The men exchanged fear-stricken gazes, and the angel let the scroll unravel, spreading onto the filthy table before them a near-endless array of constantly shifting decrees, scrawled in an eldritch ink that looked mysteriously like blood. The angel's mouth opened, and it began to speak in a ghastly, scratching wail. You've been found in violation of the Carrion King's laws. It shrieked, the old men involuntarily flinching as the horrid creatures spoke. The angel's other hand slowly rose into the air and gestured to each man who had uttered an explicative against the Carrion King in turn. Suddenly, with a speed that should have been impossible, the angel lashed out and wrenched the tongue of the ringleader right out of his mouth. The man howled, blood gushing onto the table, his incoherent wailing coming to dominate the silent tavern. The angel held still, quivering organ in its clawed grip, blood dripping from its ruptured ends and pattering on the floor. The man fell backwards, still shrieking, and his companions went to flee. The two knights barged forward and wrestled the other two to their knees. The men began to plead, but the knights and their angels did not appear to even register it. With unsettling clinical precision, the knights produced blades and cut out their respective men's tongues, the severed tips rolling out of their mouths and causing each to let out a howl of agony that joined their friend's cacophony. The entire tavern recoiled in shock, save for the jester who watched on with a sense of perverse amusement. Slowly, the angel turned on its heels and surveyed the tavern with a twitching tendon that spilled forth from its eye sockets. All hail the Carrion King, it rasped. Then it recoiled, its scroll and drifted through the crowd, exiting the way that it came as if nothing had happened, the duo of knights falling into step behind it. Isaac gazed at the spectacle, the muted cries of the three old men creating a cacophony as the tavern erupted into chaos. The bartender raced toward the three men, whilst the purple-coated man rushed back onto the stage, attempting to restore order. Then Isaac noticed him for the very first time. The only person who had remained still other than himself, he saw the jester sitting at the bar, his gaze a swirl of color Isaac knew did not exist. Then the jester began to laugh. His laughter cut through the chaos, and one by one the patrons fell silent, searching for who among them found such violence amusing. Slowly, every set of eyes came to rest on the jester. Even one of the tongueless men began to pay attention. The jester continued to laugh a hearty cackle and slowly realized that the room had gone silent. He managed to get his laughter under control, then spoke. But that angel didn't appear to get his memo, he said, erupting into giggles. He pointed to Isaac, who was stunned. That was a good one! He praised, laughing again. Isaac frowned, and the purple-coated man stepped forward, even as the bartender took the maimed men back into the kitchen to patch up their wounds as best as he could. Excuse me, sir, the purple-coated man said haughtily, but that is most inappropriate. So is that, the jester replied, pointing to the trio of tongueless men. What's the matter? Carrion King can be inappropriate, and I can't. He glided to his feet and effortlessly mounted the stage. Isaac's eyes narrowed and he took a step forward. The jester proceeded to ignore the purple-coated men and turned to Isaac. You've got talent, kid, the jester praised. Uh, th thanks, he stammered. But wh who are you? The jester cocked his head to one side, his bells ringing. Well, he said slowly. I can't really tell you. They didn't give me a name. However, I can show you and a looking at those sullen faces. 
he gestured to the still traumatized populace of the tavern. I think it might be necessary. The jester turned back to the tavern. Do you want to see something that a Carrion king doesn't want you to see? He asked. Don't answer that, for obvious reasons, he added with a coy smile. The purple-coated man stepped toward him. E Excuse me, sir, but... The jester held out a hand, and suddenly a blazing sprite blazed to life in his palm. The purple-coated man took a step backwards. The tavern took in a collective breath, and Isaac smiled. The crackling spirit swirled in the jester's palm, looking up at its summoner expectantly. The purple-coated man stared at it, his eyes comically wide. The sprite looked up at him and did a loop-de-loop, -loop, leaving a faint orange after image of its path. Slowly, the jester raised the sprite up to his lips and whispered to it. With a flourish, the spirit leapt from the jester's palm and began to whiz around the room. The tavern let out a collective whistle of awe and frantically attempted to follow the spirit's path, but the creature was too quick. Isaac took a step away from the jester and watched on, dumbfoundedly by the display. Then the jester sprung into motion. He began to dance across the stage, even as his, even as his conjured spirit continued its frenzied journey around the room, racing up towards the ceiling and zipping about merrily. The jester twirled around his hands, becoming a blur. His tirade of knives appeared in his hands, and he began to juggle them. The blades soared end over end, the jester's hands continuing at their unnatural speed, catching the daggers only to hurl them back into the bladed whirlwind that was spinning before him. The members of the tavern turned their attention back to the jester's performance, a few of them clapping as his juggling continued to pick up speed, the blades becoming almost invisible. The jester grinned and began to prance from foot to foot, breaking out into a casual jig. The blades continued to spin, his hands never faltering, never losing the rhythm. The jester leapt into the air, twirling into an airborne cartwheel, the whirlwind of blades staying constant, his jester's hat seemingly stuck to his head. The crowd let out a cheer, and the jester twirled, dropping to his knees and gazing up at the ceiling. He tossed his three knives into the air and opened his mouth, the three weapons disappearing down his pale gullet. The crowd gasped, and Isaac found him instinctively averting his gaze. However, the jester did not split, and his insides did not burst. With a belch, the three blades leapt back out of his throat, and he caught them all, beginning to juggle them once again. The tavern let out a collective cheer, and the jester gave them a wink, rising back to his feet and beginning to dance once more. He caught the three blades and effortlessly resheathed them, launching himself into an effortless backflip, then splayed his arms as the crowd erupted into applause. The jester smiled, and Isaac clapped a schoolboy's grin on his face. The purple-coated man stood starstruck, his mouth agape. The spirit zipped back to its master's waiting palm and winked out of its existence. The jester bowed. Thank you, he purred, once the applause had died. But let me tell you a secret. True art of magic is not the summoning of the spirits. In fact, it's far from. It's misdirection. He pointed at the ceiling. Slowly, the patrons of the tavern looked up. Isaac let out a laugh as he saw what was displayed there. The blazing orange aftertrail of the sprite had spelled out a simple sentence. A simple sentence that, for whatever reason, had not occurred to the patrons of the tavern. In just four words, the jester had made a statement that Isaac felt foolish for having never thought of before. The patrons of the tavern had a mixed response. Many mouths hung agape. Some of them laughed, some of them clapped, and a few of them gasped. Written on on the ceiling in slow fading ethereal letters was a simple statement the angels are blind the jester grinned and bowed then turned back to the purple coated man that's who i am he said then he pranced off the stage and headed back toward the bar isaac watched him go as the purple coated man began to speak once more his usual showman's enthusiasm mildly constrained the jester flopped back onto his stool and devoured the remains of his greasy fish as he did so the bartender in his beige shirt now stained with blood approached him the pungent aroma of cigar smoke a lingering fragrance that was quite something he gargled in his tar-slick voice. The jester turned his unnatural gaze toward the aging man. You don't have to tell me, he said with a roguish grin. The bartender merely huffed. Fish is on the house, he grumbled. The jester nodded his head in respect. Much obliged. Ale isn't, the bartender added, outstretching a huge hand palm up. The jester grinned. Naturally, he muttered. How much? The bartender shrugged. Six silver pieces, 
the man replied. The jester nodded and rifled through his pockets of his garments. He found his purse, and as he withdrew it from a deceptively cavernous pocket, he pulled a heavy fob watch out alongside it. The jester froze as he gazed at the heavy object, snagged on his knuckles, and gingerly reached down to retrieve it. His unsettling gaze lingered on the timepiece, which was a dull bronze color and had a mammoth crack on its covering. The jester's brows furrowed, and he palmed the device, slapping the light coin purse into the counter. He undid the drawstring and plucked six silver pieces from the collection of tarnished coins. He placed them onto the bartender's meaty hand, which closed around them almost immediately, pocketing the strange ancient coins and turning away from the fell but and turning away from the fell jester. The jester returned his attention to the fob watch. He placed it on the countertop beside the purse and began to scrutinize it. He knew it was his. He knew it was old. Not quite as old as he was, but from an age long past nonetheless. He knew that its current bronze coloring was not its original, the metal exterior tarnished by countless years of use. However, it was the cracks that had him perplexed. He traced them with a pale hand, racking his brain in an effort to recall how they had gotten there. When no answer presented themselves, he unlatched it to reveal the concealed clock face. It was cracked, and its hands were frozen, eternally displaying the time of 847 roughly. The jester's unholy eyes narrowed, but before he could ponder this further, somebody pulled up a stool beside him. He slowly turned his head to see Isaac, the young man's face, displaying a nervous smile. "'And what do you want?' the jester asked, picking his purse back up and putting it and his ruined watch back into his pocket that they had been drawn from. "'That was amazing,' Isaac said, his grin widening. "'I've never seen anyone do something like that.' "'Well, now you have,' the jester said." Isaac nodded slowly. How did you do it? He asked, scooting his stool closer to the jester. The jester cocked his head to one side, the bells of his hat jangling. Magic, he said simply. Isaac frowned. Oh, come on, he said. You can tell me as a professional courtesy. The jester grinned. As I said, it was magic. Isaac's face fell. Seriously? He asked. The jester nodded. I mean, I've seen magic, but nothing like that, he murmured. The jester shrugged. I think the practice is dying. There is little magic left in the world. Even the angels have become hollow. I fear the Carrion King himself might be the only real wizard left, other than me. Of course. Isaac nodded slowly, the youthful grin re-emerging on his features. So, where are you from then? He asked. Because you're not from Brookshire and I've never seen you in any of the other shires either. The jester smiled. I am from the West, he said. Isaac's eyes widened slightly. The West? He said, a childlike longing in his voice. Don't get your hopes up, the jester replied. It's not like it was. Where is the West? Isaac pressed. The horizon, the jester replied cryptically. Isaac's eyes narrowed as if contemplating calling out what he had alleged to be a lie. He refrained. What are you doing here then? He asked. The jester's unholy eyes swirled for a moment, and then he replied, I don't really know, he said candidly. I just washed up. I don't remember anything. He stared off into space for a moment. Then his eyes visibly racked back into focus, and he smiled. Okay, Isaac said. But you didn't answer my question. I asked you what you were doing here, not how you got here. The jester stopped for a moment. You're a sharp boy, he said. In truth, I'm just passing through. Passing through to where? I travel to the car to the Carrion King, the jester replied quietly. Isaac's eyes widened. You can't say that, he hissed. The jester smiled. Don't worry, he replied, casually dismissing Isaac's concern. The angels can't hurt me, and the knights wouldn't stand a chance. You don't know that, Isaac insisted, keeping his voice a barely audible whisper. The jester chuckled. I do, he said surely. The Carrion King is expecting me. The angels are not permitted to hurt me. Isaac's brow furrowed in confusion. Why? he asked. That's just the way this works, the jester said. Just the way what works? Isaac asked. This journey of mine, the jester elaborated. I shall face the Carrion King in time. But why? He and I go way back, the jester said. Isaac's eyes glinted with curiosity. Really? The jester nodded. Unfortunately... How far back? He asked. The jester grinned. How old are you? Uh, twenty years of age, Isaac replied. Take that number and exponentially multiply it by infinity, the jester said. That's how far back we go. Isaac's brow furrowed. I don't understand, he murmured. 
I was never exactly wizard material, despite dad's best efforts. The numbers never made sense. The jester shrugged. Words make sense to you, yeah? You understand how to twist them. That is a gift that you cannot be taught. Not like numbers of ex- Not like numbers and exponentials and alchemy. He cocked his head to one side, his bells letting out their little jangle. The jester gazed up at them mournfully. I really liked his hat, he lamented, reaching up and fingering the frayed ends where the ever-elusive fifth bell could have been attached. Oh well. There was a moment of silence. So, Isaac said slowly. So, the jester asked, arching what should have been an eyebrow. You're traveling to the west? Indeed. What's it like? Isaac asked. The journey or the west itself? The jester asked. Isaac shrugged. Both, I suppose, he clarified. The jester tapped his chin contemplatively. The west, he began, his eyes growing distant, is corrupt and foul. A dark land infested by vampires and ghouls and the angels of Carrion King. Not like this place. This place is still somewhat pure. Isaac shrugged. It's nice he murmured, but I want more. Mar, the jester inquired. Isaac sat up. Yeah, he said, reaching up and pulling the hat from his head to allow thick curls to spill forth. I mean, this place is nice, it's relatively peaceful and providing we pay the tithes, but I don't know. I want my life to be more than farming and fishing and performing in taverns like this. The jester gazed at him sadly. Isaac, he began. You're talented. Isaac beamed at this. You're funny, and you still manage to struggle through enough of the truth. That's why people like you. Even more impressive is that angels don't seem to care. It's not that impressive, Isaac cut in. They don't understand sarcasm or satire. They take everything I say literally. They don't understand humans. They never did, the jester muttered. Isaac raised an eyebrow expectantly. The jester sighed. That's why the Carrion King bested him. That's why they turned to the creatures that didn't fully understand for salvation. The Carrion King? Isaac murmured. The jester nodded. I was there. I saw it happen. I saw legions of angels put out their own eyes in order to serve him. But why? Because it was easy. Because they desired revenge on man who had vanquished them. They desired revenge so much so that they sold their own soul to the creature you know as the Carrion King. How do you know all of this? Isaac asked. As I said, I was there. But, but you can't have been. The Carrion King's been in power for... He trailed off, his eyes narrowing. The jester smiled. Far. I don't know. It feels like forever. Indeed, it does. But to return to your original question, the journey there is long and arduous. Are you wishing to partake in it? Isaac's eyes widened. One day, maybe. You're young and you're talented. That's exactly what the West wants for itself, I warn ya. They will corrupt ya. The angels might not understand sarcasm, but the vampires do. And you'll soon learn that the Carrion King and his alleged cart of members would not take kindly to the shows that you just performed. I'll take my chances, Isaac said defiantly. The jester laughed. Brave or foolish, but those states are oftentimes divided only by success. But I ask you again, do you wish to partake in a journey? Isaac looked into the unholy eyes. Seriously? I could come with you. If that is what you truly desire, the jester said, leaning back in his chair. I'm traveling that way anyway. I, I'd have to think about it. Uh, I'd have to tell my parents. I leave tomorrow, the jester cut in. If you are serious about this, then come with me. Then come with me. Isaac sighed and stared down at his feet. I don't know. I want it more than anything. Then come with me, the jester said again. Isaac looked up at him, conflict visible in the depths of his soul. How would we get there? He asked. Now we would walk. Walk? Isaac asked, incredulous. The jester nodded. We would travel to the great city of glass, and from there, we would board a transport that would take us to Los, the capital city of the West. From there, we can enter the court of the Carrion King. Isaac fidgeted. You could take me there? Right into the... He caught himself. The place that is not the court of the Carrion King? The jester smiled. Aye, he said. Isaac rested his chin in his fists. That's every jester's dream. I mean, I know it's not supposed to exist, but you hear the stories. The jester rose to his feet. Listen to me, little Isaac. You have to make a choice, here and now. I am your inciting incident, your call to adventure. Should you stay here, your life will continue as it always has. You'll find a spouse, you'll grow old. You will continue to fret upon stage like that until one day your tongue slips and an angel comes up for it. Or you can meet me tomorrow morning behind the clock tower at the first rays of dawn and we can depart for the west. If you choose that path, you shall face other choices. 
but your ultimate fate is unknown. Sleep on it, or don't. With that, the jester turned and walked toward the doorway, exiting into the night breeze. Isaac watched him go, his chest writhing in both excitement and dread. As if in a trance, he rose to his feet and headed toward the doorway, his mind whirring. The jester walked into the night breeze, the sound of merriment still audible from the tavern behind him. The countryside lay sprawl out before him, flickering lights visible in the windows of many a farmhouse. The jester took in a massive breath, savoring the smell of fresh, unpolluted air. Slowly, he walked down the street, away from the tavern in the clock tower and towards the church. Of all of the buildings in Brookshire, the church was dark. No candle light flickered in the stained glass windows, and no one dared approach it. With a bizarre sense of familiarity, the jester immediately knew that the people of Brookshire did not visit the church anymore. He knew with certainty that transcended reason, as if it was fated to be that the being he sought would be lurking there. Slowly, he entered the church. Its ancient double doors creaked open and slipped inside. The first thing he noticed was the cold. The frigid air wafted from stones of its walls, and the jester made its way through the tiny foyer and into the main hall. Rows of splintering pews were laid out across the chamber, and on a raised podium at the far wall, a banner for the Carrion King was mounted. Upon it, daubed in threads of vibrant darkness, was the sigil of the Carrion King. A pale skull, a tongue lolling out of the mandibles, its eyes weeping blood and a spiked crown atop its head, a thousand severed eyeballs skewered on its tip. There was a being standing before the sigil. Standing there, alone, was a ghastly angel. It stood there, its slit-like nostrils flaring, the duo of knights nowhere to be seen. The jester came to stop beside it. The angel did not visibly react to his presence until he spoke. How far your kind have fallen, he said, his voice echoing eerily into the cavernous room. The angel stiffened and twisted its ghoulish head to face him, the severed tendons of its eyes quivering. The angel's ravaged face turned into a mockery of a grin, and it replied in its ghastly rasp. I think the same can be said of yours, it said with a hissing cackle. The jester chuckled. I concede that point he said, his eyes flickering to the sigil. The world has grown stale. The world grew stale long ago, the angel hissed. The jester shrugged. All hail the Carrion King, he said with a smile. The angel let out a hissing giggle. All hail the Carrion King, it echoed, the two of them continuing to laugh. Once their laughter had subsided, the jester's eyes flickered back to the sigil. You didn't have to pull out a man's tongue, he said after a moment's pause. He and his friends were old, they were drunk, they were harmless. And now they are tongueless, said the angel. That is the price you paid of uttering such blasphemies. The jester locked his eyes with the angel's sockets. All hail the Carrion King. It rasped, letting out a giggle. The jester's face suddenly became grave, his eyes swirling into an array of unnameable colors, its effects lost on the slightless being. The gods who once served are long dead, their laws along with them. I understand wanting revenge on the last great king, but you made a bargain with the darkness. You know what you're doing is wrong, and yet you do it. You're not like the knights. Better old men than me, the angel said. The world has changed, and as time, its people accepted that change. They'll never accept it. They're human. You can tell them to do something, and it just makes them want to do the opposite. Perhaps, the angel agreed. They dance on strings, as do you. As does my master, the angel grinned. As do I. It paused for a moment. I see your strings, though I do not see who pulls them. The jester's unholy eyes locked with the angel's flayed tendons. As I see yours, he countered. Even I am not as tangled as you are. The thread of fate have you in a noose. You dance upon the stage the puppet of something else. How many times have you done this tired routine, Jester? The Jester's brow furrowed. Not enough, it seems. The angel tapped its fingers together. And yet, still... You persist. Still, you fret your fifteen minutes upon the stage, trying to end the reign of my master. Still, you fail. The people still kneel. They still welcome him, willingly. I can only show them the dar. I can't make them rock through it. When all the world is blind, you won't even be able to do that. They're born with eyes, the jester said. Eyes can be taken away. The jester smiled thinly and murmured, All hail to Carrion King. 
The two beings fell into silence as a gust of wind stabbed through the hollow church, causing the jester's bells to jangle and the greasy feathers of the angel to blow out. He's expecting you, the angel said. I know, the jester replied. He has ordered us to let you pass. I'll be sure to let him know how grateful I am, the jester replied with a smile. The knights are not under such instruction. Oh, they are young and they are zealous. Any who cross their king, they shall attempt to kill, like rabid hounds. They know not what they do is wrong. They are not as privy as the king's decrees. Useful idiots. I've seen their kind countless times before. Idiots, perhaps. Useful, definitely. Potent, without us, they are but children, blind children playing with swords. We angels recognize that we have fallen. They do not. Teach them that murder is right, and they shall murder. Teach them that slavery is freedom, and they will wrap themselves in chains. Teach them that words are weapons, and their conjurers are attackers, and they will fight. Words are weapons, the jester said. The angel shrugged its gaunt shoulders. Perhaps, but then, if that were true, why would any master desire your presence so? Because he's like you. He's compelled. Even if he thinks that this is wrong, he is forced to meet me. As you said, he is too tangled in strings. You are but words, Jester. The master owns those words now. He can twist them. He can erase them. Tell me, Jester, when the words are all gone, what power will you hold? Before the angel could react, the jester had drawn one of his three blades and had it poised on the angel's wrinkled neck. I more than just words, angel. Far more. The angel gingerly placed a talon on the blade's tip and gently nudged it away. You will not kill me, it said simply. There is a string on your arm and it was pulled tout. The jester smiled, but before their confrontation could continue, the clock tower began to chime. The jester let out a laugh and allowed his blade to drop to his side. I need some sleep, he muttered, once the chimes had fallen silent. I have a long journey ahead of me. Then I wish you safe travels, jester, the angel hissed. With that, the angel spread its wings and took to the rafters, where it perched above the jester and fell silent. The jester's unnatural eyes gazed at the Carrion King's sigil one final time. Then he repocketed his blade and strode toward the exit, the bells atop his hat jangling merrily. He exited into the night breeze, the damp grass being crushed beneath his footfalls. He walked back up the high street, past the still bustling taverns, past the clock tower, and onto the rolling hills that lay beyond. Laid out before him was the entirety of Brookshire, its hundreds of farmhouses extended toward the horizon, their lights flickering against the building winds. Beyond Brookshire was the other shires, and beyond that the faintest glint of a glass spire. The last true jester of the west gazed toward the place of his namesake, and then slowly turned on his heel and walked toward the wall of the clock tower. He pressed his back against it and fell to the ground. His unholy eyes closed, and he drifted into a light slumber as the wind began to howl. Isaac skipped up the steps of his family homestead, lantern light flickering within and spilling out into the night. His boots hammered on the wooden steps and he cricked the door open, allowing him entrance into the expensive farmhouse. The wind howled as he forced the door closed, his jester's cap tucked under his arm. Once he had relatched the door, he turned around and let out a breath. The interior of the Veritas household was open plan and homely. The vast living space dominated most of the floor, a kitchen toward the back, a corridor leading to the bedrooms beyond that. Sitting in the center of the living room was one of Isaac's three siblings. His sister, Morgana, his junior of by two years, was sitting in the center of the room in a set of blue robes. Long dark hair was draped over her face, her blazing blue eyes staring intently at the collection of wooden blocks before her. Her eyes appeared to be glowing slightly, her lips frantic moving and muttering an incantation under her breath. The blocks before her were not sitting on the ground, however. They were suspended before her, faint auras of blue power blinking around them. Isaac stopped and observed his sister's sorceress works for a moment. Then, a smile spread over his features once more. Abracadabra, he shouted. Morgana's concentration faltered and the blocks cascaded to the floor. She shot Isaac a venomous glare and pushed her thick hair out of her face. Isaac! She hissed. I was concentrating. 
past tense, indeed, Isaac said with a grin as he made his way past her and toward the kitchen. Standing in the kitchen was his mother, an aging and pleasantly plump woman, and his other sister, Margaret. They were washing a collection of dishes. Sitting in a weathered chair in the corner of the living room was his father, a hulking farmer who was losing his hair a pipe between his teeth. He did not see his brother anywhere. Hello, everyone. Isaac said. His father let out a grunt of affirmation, and his mother turned back from the sink and smiled. How was the show? She asked. Good, Isaac said slowly, placing his hat onto the countertop. Potentially very good. His mother raised an eyebrow. Did anybody get their tongues ripped out? Margaret, Isaac's six-year-old sister, asked innocently. Mrs. Veritas reeled on her daughter. That is most inappropriate from a lady like you, she scowled. Margaret made a face and Isaac laughed. Yeah, he said curtly. Why? They must have said something bad, Morgana cut in from the living room. Angels don't rip your tongue out for nothing. Isaac rolled his eyes and risked a glance to his father, who shook his head subtly. They said some bad things, he said to Margaret. Oh, the little girl murmured. But on the plus side, the people still love me. Isaac smiled. Oh, that's nice, honey, Mrs. Veritas said, turning back to her dishes. Uh, somebody interesting showed up, Isaac continued, a little disheartened by his family's seeming disinterest. Oh, his mother asked. Yeah, some big shot jester from out of town. He's very good, did magic that was, well, real magic. Not like Morgana's academics over here. He jokingly gestured to where his sister was attempting to return her concentration to her collection of blocks. Anyway... He liked my routine. That's good, his mother praised. Isaac saw his father's shift slightly behind him and worked up the courage to tell him the truth. He really liked my routine. He, um, well, he asked if I wanted to travel with him to the West. Isaac's mother froze and dropped a plate that she had dried back into the sink. Mr. Veritas snuffed out his pipe and paid closer attention to the conversation. Oh, his mother said slowly, not turning around. Yeah. Isaac said, his excitement threatening to burst through. He said that he's going to perform for the Carrion King himself and he wants me to come with him. Morgana began to pay attention at the mention of her liege. This could be the shot that I've been after for years, Isaac continued. Jesters go their entire lives without ever even getting to the West, let alone to perform for the King himself. Mrs. Veritas slowly turned around. Isaac? I know that you've always wanted this, and you've been working so hard, and I'm very proud of you, but are you sure that you're not going a little too fast here? I understand that maybe you and this jester have a certain chemistry with one another. Mr. Veritas visibly stiffened. Your father and I were the same, but if he asked me to run off to the West with him after our first date... Mom, it's not like that. Isaac exclaimed. I know that you were hurt after Jack went out west, and I know that he broke your heart, and mom, it's not romantic, Isaac insisted. I just met him. He just liked my jesting. That's it. Slowly, Mr. Veritas got to his feet and walked over. Martha, he said in his gruff voice, let me talk to him for a moment. Isaac gulped and turned to face his father. Martha Veritas turned back to her washing, and Isaac began to feel impossibly guilty. Then his father had put a calloused hand on his shoulder. Come on, he said. Just a word. Bruce Veritas led his son toward the back of the house. They reached the door at the end of the corridor, and Bruce pushed it open, exiting into the chilly night. Isaac followed. The two of, the two of them hopped off of the back porch and came to a stop by a small pile of logs. The entirety of the Veritas farm laid out before them. Fields of corn extended toward the horizon, and a number of shakily constructed pens contained the few animals the family could afford. Bruce leaned back against the log pile and turned to his son. Isaac came to a stop and fidgeted awkwardly, avoiding his father's gaze. Listen, Isaac, I know that you and I haven't exactly got on as well as either of us would have liked. I know that we didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things that I see now were very important to you, and I admit that I should have been a little more supportive, and for that I am sorry. Isaac raised an eyebrow in disbelief, tears threatening to brim his eyes. Okay, he said shakily. His father sighed and ran his fingers through his almost non-existent hair. What I'm trying to say is that I want to support you now, his father said finally, and if you think this jester can give you your shot, I say take it. Don't worry about us. Since you were th this small, he held a hand to his knee. You've wanted to go to the West to be a jester. He managed to lock eyes with Isaac. Go. 
Leave your mother to me. Besides, Morgana's uh, heading off to Academy next year anyway. It wouldn't be fair to tell her that she could go to become a wizard and not let you go to become a jester. A lone tear trickled down Isaac's cheek. Thanks, father, he stammered. I... You don't need to thank me. Bruce cut him off. I'm your father. I'd be so a sorry excuse for one if I just kept you here. There comes a time in every man's life that he must flee to the nest to make his own. He placed a meaty hand on Isaac's shoulder. Go out west, my boy. Besides, I still have Trevor to help me on the farm. He's not exactly gifted with the intellect of you or your sister. Bruce grinned, and Isaac let out a shaky laugh. Th thank you, he croaked. Yeah. Bruce patted him on the shoulder. I know that we've had our differences in the past, but... You're my son. Go make me proud. Another tear trickled down Isaac's cheek. But promise me two things. Anything. Bruce gazed deep into his eyes. Try not to get yourself killed, and don't let the Carrion King buy you. It's better to die your own man than to live as someone else's. Isaac nodded. The wind howled, punctuating the moment of silence. I hope you make it back to us one day. But just in case. Suddenly, the huge farmer pulled Isaac into a bear hug, a hug that the young jester returned. They stayed there for many moments, then Bruce pushed them apart and sniffled slightly, trying to mask the sound as clearing his throat. As I said, let me talk to your mother. Isaac smiled, and the two men began to walk back to the house. When do you leave? Tomorrow, Isaac murmured. Bruce smiled. Looks like I'm really going to have to work my magic on her, if you know what I mean. Might end up with a fifth little Veritas to replace you. Bruce laughed, and Isaac joined in. He felt a warmth that he had been depraved of for many years, but he had to remind himself that it was his father and his constant innuendos who had inspired him to pursue jesting in the first place. I'm sure you still have some moves, old man, Isaac said with a grin. Bruce chuckled. Wouldn't you like to know? The two men smiled, and Bruce pushed the door to a house back open, spilling trace amounts of candlelight into the night air. They entered the homestead, closing the door behind them, and headed back into the kitchen. Martha, Veritas, and Margaret were putting away the last of the dishes, and Morgana had her triad of blocks levitating before her once more. Martha looked up as the two of them approached. Martha, we need to talk. Bruce said. Tears welled in Martha's eyes, but she nodded, and the two of them made their way into their bedroom. Isaac awkwardly walked into the kitchen and leaned against the countertop. He could hear his parents having a hushed conversation in the other room, and from the hallway his brother, Trevor, emerged. Trevor was a few years younger than Isaac, but already had the thick muscles of their father forming, being the primary hand on the farm. Wait, Isaac, you're leaving? He asked, evidently having overheard parts of the conversation. Isaac looked at him and nodded gravely. Trevor smiled. Can I have your bedroom? He asked with a grin. Isaac let out a laugh, which caused Morgana to lose her shaky concentration and the blocks that she had been controlling to tumble back to the ground. The girl grumbled and got to her feet, leaving the wooden objects discarded. What if I want it? She snapped. I'm older, but you'll be leaving next year, Trevor countered, crossing his arms. To go to Academy? He sneered the last words. Morgana's eyes flashed blue, and the telekinetic force came to slap Trevor on the back of his head. Ow! He complained, massaging the impacted area. Before either could continue, Margaret stepped forward. I don't want you to leave, she said softly. I'll miss you too much. Isaac felt himself tear up as he turned toward his little sister. He choked up, trying to find a reply. The little girl stepped forward and wrapped her arms around his stomach. Isaac let out a small laugh and knelt down before her, taking her tiny hands in his. I was always going to leave, though, he said softly. Margaret began to cry, tears sliding down her small cheeks. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for me. Margaret's bottom lips trembled. I'll, I'll write to you. Isaac said earnestly, and who knows, I'll be able to send you some pretty interesting presents back from the celebration of the solstice. It's not a solstice anymore, Morgana reminded them harshly. Trevor laughed. Oh, Morg, he said, if you love the Carrion King so much, then why don't you just go to the west and suck him off? Morgana reeled on him, her eyes crackling to life once again. Oh no, Trevor exclaimed. Am I to be smitten by your sorceress powers? Her eyes flickered back to her normal color and that she smiled thinly. Trevor turned back to Isaac. All right, Isaac, good luck, brother. 
I'm getting some sleep before this witch dismembers me with lightning or something. Isaac chuckled, rose to his feet, and embraced his brother. Trevor returned to embrace, and after a few moments, the two of them broke apart. Margaret continued to cry, shuffled back over to Isaac, and hooked her arms around his legs. Isaac looked down at her. Don't worry. I'll be back in time to see you at the academy or something, he said. I don't want to go to the academy, Margaret said matter-of-factly. Isaac raised an eyebrow. Oh? I want to be a jester, like you. She looked up and flashed him an innocent smile, proudly displaying her milk teeth. Well, in that case, Isaac said, I'll see you in the West one day. She giggled at this and let her hands fall away from her brother. Isaac looked up at Morgana and locked eyes with her. Good luck, big brother, she said. You too, he replied. I hope the Academy is everything that you hope it is. It will be, she said surely. Isaac walked forward and embraced her. Then the two broke apart and Isaac walked toward his room.